Okay, so today I'm revisiting Barry Dennis. Barry, we talked in 2018 and you gave us a pretty detailed account of your... 2018, uh, was it long ago, was that? As long ago as it was, yeah. You give us a pretty detailed account of your sort of rise in the, in the betting ring. Then we come back now, um, and what we'd like is really a masterclass. Oh, you okay. to yeah. explain to people how they can do it and where they and mistakes they can not make and things like that. So um, if you're happy for us to pick your brains... Well, you know the old maxim, don't you, about how you do it? Tickets and short, that's all you need, but I'm not, not sure it doesn't right nowadays. Well, when you started, it was right, because you were, you were on the waiting, years, uh, waiting list for years, waiting for people to die so you could get a pitch. And then you, when you did get pitches, you were betting in what can be described as quite poor positions. In Very poor, poor yeah. Rings. yeah. I mean, can small margins and poor turnover be sort of ignored a bit if you know that the punters can't possibly win, which I assume they can't in those sort of rings? Or have I got that totally wrong? Um, small margins and small turnover, you can make a profit. But you've got to decide what profit you need every day, what are your ambitions when you go out to work, haven't you? Like, I don't know, if I read last week, the average wage is approaching £200 a week. And so if you think you can get £200 a week out of on-course bookmaking, betting in poorer positions and a small turnover, net, we're talking about net, of now, how expenses have increased over the last 10, 12, 15 years, I think it'd be difficult to achieve £200 a week on small turnover. But would the um, would you really sort of stick it up for a favourite a bit if you thought that all the people in front of you ultimately couldn't win in the long run? No, I try not to. I do have fancies sometimes of being against a particular favourite. It's probably brought on by that um, Bismarck bloody stuff, wasn't it? Like you know what I mean? And um, then they come to the races and they expect me to be over the odds at all, regardless. And um, the famous ones is old oh, Barry Lamy ten to one. I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "You said it couldn't win." I said, "Yeah, but didn't say we couldn't win at ten to one." <laughs> and um, they go you into wanting to go bigger prices, but percentages are everything, aren't they? Every business, not only bookmaking, on course. Turnover and percentages are the answer to every business there is. Okay, now we're going to fast forward to this is you and your pomp. You told a story in the last interview about ultimately then JP McManus, who's no mug, and that £80,000 bet because he called it in when you were on the telly. Now, is a big ego a bit of an Achilles heel when you're a bookmaker? Yes. Definitely there it was, definitely. They were swooping around with the camera before the first race trying to get stories, obviously. And um, it was 11 or 8 general everywhere, the horse, and so I said, uh, I'm going to go 6 to 4 this. I said, um, stop me when I've laid about £20,000 worth. And so 6 to 4, 6 to 4, here, 6 to 4. What's the name of the horse, do you remember? I can't remember what it was called now, no. No, nor could I. But anyway, suddenly up his face popped as I told you and um, now I've got the cameras on me and now I've got all the punters around me. I can't back down and look a mug, can I? Like, uh, so I've got to keep the bravado up and stupidly laid him £80,000 worth of six to four. And, um, oh, was it Barracuda? That's the one, that was the one. Yeah. And um, the time the race come around, I'd managed to get £20,000 perhaps back at six to during the course of the afternoon. But I was still standing it for far much more money than I ought to be doing it. Like, I respect JP McManus. Respect that he doesn't throw his money around like, you know what I mean, and whatever his backs represents good value if you was following him in. And so, English Dreaver, I think, was the one that came and beat it. I remember the day now, coming down from the top of the hill, it was about two to jump, that had gone clear. Barracuda was drawing two or three lengths clear of horse called English Dreaver, and that was clear of the rest of the field, there wasn't another horse in sight. So I stood like Hans looking at the clerk, and they were looking away, wouldn't look me in the eyes. And um, 
the staff are all disappearing fast, you know what I mean? They don't want to be around when um, <laughs> it goes by side. Um, what did they say? God was a bookmaker because suddenly on the uphill stretch, Barracuda's stride started shortening and English Dream would come and beat it quite easily. And so I sat down with relief, but didn't show too much to the public, you know what I mean? It meant that much to me, but anyway. Um, that was a stupid thing to do, and it, exactly what you're saying is part of my ego that got me involved in that one. Uh, so that was a lesson learned, wasn't it? Don't I was going to say, did you learn? Did you not ever do that again? No, never. I, I couldn't be goaded and laying over the odds just for ego ever again. Yeah. Now you got in the good pitches, and you, a lot of times you would have been betting to good margins, to good money. Yeah. When you're betting well, do you sometimes you get a bit complacent when somebody sharp comes in? Will you just absorb that into the market or would you still take notice of their money? I still take notice of... Obviously when you're in the game a hell of a long time, as in my case, was it now? I'm 81. Over 60 years I've been in the business like on course, alone. The, um, certain faces are drawing more often than others and you want to mark what they do. They must know more than I do, mustn't they, when they're having their bets. But... Um, I don't ever refuse their bets. If it's on the board, I lay them a bet. I don't always hedge it immediately, but I'm just cautious about what... If I could hedge at that time easily, half of the money, I would be doing it, yes. But if it was tight once he'd laid the bet, or... You've got to remember, other people are watching these sharpos as well, and as soon as it goes in, the whole ring collapses for temporarily. Sometimes it comes back, but... Um, so... That was a lesson learned. Don't don't show off too much, but it ain't too clever. Who would have been the one that put the fear of God into Barry Dennis the most? Um, have you ever heard of Johnny Lights? Yeah, big lad. Yeah, and um, Daddy Roberts. Yeah them too. Uh, they had the ear of the Ladbrokes rep and they suddenly emerged from the rails taking a price 6 to 4 11 to 8 and within a minute of them doing that the Ladbrokes rep was out taking 5 to 4 and 11 to 10. And um, you were on offer, weren't you? Once you're laying 6 to 4, something's going to start evens in two minutes. That's not good. So you had to learn. I didn't have a bluff them, but you had to cut them down like significantly. Otherwise, you you got no chance playing them. You were just giving away money, like laying them 6 to 4, even money chances. And... Um, you couldn't win off them long run. Now, apart from the uh, long course business, you also had a betting shop. Do you regret not going for like f fleets and fleets of betting shops and expanding in that way? That was my idea. When I went in the first one in Romford Market, I thought, this game's easy. Like, why aren't I in betting shops? I've got to get into it. So we went for a big style betting shop in Romford Market. I started my life off by working in a betting shop in Romford Market back in the late, I wouldn't say the late 50s, but betting shops, as you know, weren't actually legal until 60, 61, was it? Uh, Before my time back, luckily. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I wanted to get back into Romford Market where I was known, like I was... I was Romford Market, I was born in Romford Market, I was a barren boy in Romford Market and I knew it would be working so we eventually got the licence in there after objections from the big firms and then I was mildly disappointed quite truthfully that I got it when I'm on it. On course turnover was now averaging 40,000 pound a day and the betting shop was turning over 5,000 pound a day and I couldn't see how to improve it 
on calls, I'm a face to face with people and can do offers that the public can see and that react to. Whereas in a betting shop, you've got, you know, apart from trying to put something in the window, I always put up extra places in big races and all that in the window, but it doesn't encourage any punters long term. And now was already the time that betting exchanges were starting to come in. The big rollers didn't need betting shops anymore, did they? They was able to go onto the exchanges and get better rods. So I think I was in it for three or four years. I got the shop, and it didn't turn out like I, the biggest earner was the good one was the, the machines. Like every shop had four machines in, and they were showing me four thousand pound, a thousand pound each machine, four thousand pound a week profit. Well, the, the cost of the rest of the gear, having um, to pay for buying licenses to take football bets, paying for licenses for horse racing, all the add-ons that come with that. I'm, I thought you, know, you could earn 20% gross on over-the-counter business. Well, it didn't work in the shop I had in Romford Market. Um, I was barely clearing 10% gross. And the figures after four years, I looked at them. Every week, on average, including the machines, the shop was showing me £7,000 a week gross profit. My son Patrick and I were half in it each. And um, expenses were coming to five and a half thousand pound a week. So the remaining fifteen hundred quid, we had seven hundred and fifty quid each. Take the tax on seven hundred and fifty quid, and I thought, what am I doing here? Like, I mean, having all this hassle, and it's a lot more hassle on it. It's a lot more hassle running a betting shop than it is on course. On course, you take bets. I pass five, you wipe your mouth, walk away. That's the end of it, isn't it? There ain't no more hassle with it on calls. Betting shops, you've got all the other liabilities and problems and tax returns and forms. They invent a new form every day, you know, it's just to send out to test your skills. So it didn't work out as I expected. So after William Hill came into an offer I couldn't refuse for the shop. It's a good position, it's right in the centre of the market. But, um, no, I was disillusioned with betting shops. <laughs>